Okay, I think it's time. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another lecture of uh, computer architecture. Today we have lecture 22. Uh, we're gonna discuss uh, many interesting topics today. We will start by the overall concept of simulation, uh, why we need the simulations and what are different types of simulations. So there could be, there would be uh, some general and let's say general challenges uh, about simulations as well. But after that, we're gonna have a talk on Remulator 2, uh, which is the basically the latest version of Remulator that we have uh, uh, released. And after that, the third part of this lecture is gonna be about MQSIM as the state-of-the-art SSD simulator um, that Rakesh will also uh, present it. So it's gonna be a lot of fun today, I guess. Okay. So, so basically I want to start with why we need to simulate systems or simulate memory systems. The focus is more or less on memory and storage in today's uh, talk, but essentially what we are gonna cover about simulation can be also applied to other uh, parts of the system. So it's not only about memory or storage. So basically uh, we want to evaluate methods. So whenever you as a designer, you want to assess how an idea will affect the target metric X. And that metric X could be performance, could be energy, power, area, security, reliability, and so on and so forth. So basically you want to analyze or assess the effect of your idea on a certain metrics. So there are a variety of evaluation methods uh, that we can use. The first one is theoretical proof, which is nice uh, if we can prove something that for example, my, the design uh, we develop is the best one in terms of performance. But the thing is that it's not usually possible to uh, prove something. So the moment that we want to uh, make a proof uh, for, for, our, for our design or for an, an idea, we need to make some assumptions. And those assumptions, um, essentially they put some restrictions on your problem or on the effect of your uh, design and idea, which in the end, uh, what you are proving cannot be applied to a general case, basically. So that's the main limitation that we have with theoretical proof. So we have different components in our systems. We have also many, many workloads uh, with different behaviors. So for example, when you want to uh, make a proof like the, the, the average heat rate of your cache, for example, so you need to make some assumptions regarding the access pattern of, of the workloads or the frequency of the memory accesses. So there, there are some assumptions in that. And in the end, uh, when you prove something, you cannot apply or apply to a general case. So that's why uh, we don't really do theoretical proof. Uh, I mean, we do. Uh, for example, for some cases like uh, for row hammer defense technique, actually, uh, we have done some uh, proof that why this technique is actually secure. Uh, but, in, we, but we don't do theoretical proof in general cases, let's say. Another uh, way to evaluate is using analytical modeling or some estimation. Uh, this has been used a lot in many works actually. Um, for example, in order to uh, analyze or estimate the energy consumption of the, of the system, so usually we know that our system is uh, basically includes uh, different components and, uh, and we have the number of energy uh, per access or per energy per instruction or energy per activity for every, for, uh, I mean, per uh, component. And then we need to kind of, you know, count the number of accesses, for example, to the memory, the number of instructions in the CPU, and once you have this energy per instruction, for example, you can just uh, multiply the number of instructions to the energy per instruction, and you can somehow estimate the overall energy consumption of the CPU. Or you can also do the same for memory, storage, interconnect, and so on and so forth. So the, this analytical modeling actually has been used a lot, and it is very good because it's very fast, but its accuracy is also sometimes questionable. So we should be careful about uh, using that. But as I said, it has been widely used in many uh, works and 
basic evaluation methods. The third one, which is quite interesting, is actually simulation at varying degree of, of abstraction and accuracy. So whenever you want to evaluate your design, you somehow simulate uh, details of that components. And that details could be at a very, very high level. You just, for example, simulate the functions of that component or could be more detailed. For example, I will also simulate uh, detailed communication or detailed uh, timing of that component. Or could be even more, uh, let's say, uh, detailed. Like I go deep into the hardware implementation of that and I simulate the gate level of my design. You guys have uh, done uh, already lab one, for example, and you design, for example, uh, <clears throat> a cache simulator, right? And you use, I guess, uh, C++ language or C for, uh, for that cache lab. Am I right? Yeah. But it, it, uh, previous versions of that lab actually was uh, with uh, using HDL. So we were using a very large, for example, as an example, uh, to, to simulate uh, cache and hardware. But we changed it to C++ and using a higher level language. But basically, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the case for simulation. You can do simulation in very different uh, abstraction layer. Another way of uh, evaluating is actually coming up with prototyping. Um, so you want to somehow build your system. So with simulator, we don't build our system. It's just uh, simulation. Mostly we use uh, software tools to uh, basically test our idea. But with uh, prototyping is actually something in middle way between uh, simulating and also building the real hardware. So for example, we can use FPGAs uh, to model the uh, some basically functions or some operations that we are expecting from our hardware. So with prototyping, we can actually uh, make some, we, we can evaluate our system uh, more accurately in some sense. But it has also some, uh, let's say, limitations because so now you are limited uh, with the resources that you have, for example, in FPJ. So FPJ, for example, they cannot operate at high frequency. So if you are, uh, can someone uh, disable the waiting room in Zoom? I think uh, host or co-host can do it. Okay. So yeah, uh, basically, we, uh, for example, FPGAs, they cannot work with high frequency. So if you, for example, prototype your uh, CPU, um, a new core design with FPGA, so that uh, core that you prototyping cannot operate at high frequency, for example. So in the end, you are limited by the, by the hardware that you have in FPGA or any platform that you are prototyping with that. And... Uh, And basically the last item is actually real implementation, which uh, we do uh, basically implement our device or system. Um, once we are, I mean, with high confidence, we are sure that this idea is gonna work. So basically the idea of having all these evaluation uh, methods is that we want to get some confidence about uh, how useful this idea or this chip or this design can be. And once we are sure about the effect of that, we can try to implement it in a real hardware because it's gonna be very costly and time consuming. Uh, so we don't want to spend time on it for uh, basically uh, for every idea. Any question? Okay. So, let me quickly uh, give you an example of prototyping platform. I guess you guys have already uh, learned about it, which is PyDRAM. Uh, we have uh, basically Atoberg, he was, uh, he, he drove this project and it's about, uh, so we, we implement a real processing using memory prototype. So PyDRAM is a FPGA uh, implementation that com FPGA communicates with the DRAM modules. And together with that, we can implement many different, uh, let's say, uh, processing using memory, like an end-to-end -end approach. So for example, we have shown that uh, with uh, PyDRAM, we can implement row clone, we can test uh, row clone. But as I said, uh, 
This is also this is the implementation of that FPJ board with a RISC-V system. And this PIM enabled team uh, that essentially we do, for example, row clone uh, in those team. And we release the implementation on our system. I'm, I'm skipping this slide relatively quickly because you guys have already learned uh, about PyDRAM. And these are some results that we show that, for example, with indiram copy and initialization, we can, for example, improve throughput by uh, 119 times and 89 times. But yeah, but basically, but in the end uh, here also, even though we implement, uh, we prototype this uh, processing using memory like the row clone, but still we are limited by the, but what we can provide in that FPG. So if you, for example, check that uh, PyDRAM paper, you will realize that, for example, we, we are limited in uh, frequency of uh, FPG. Or for example, uh, we couldn't uh, test uh, uh, ambit idea, for example. We could test, for example, row clone, but we couldn't test ambit. Could be because we are, on, so the, the, our control is actually only on FPG, but from the DRAM side, we don't have control. So we are trying to uh, play with some uh, parameters in order to uh, basically make row clone inside the DRAM. But essentially, if you can uh, do some, uh, let's say, if you can build a memory module uh, such that can do ambit operation, like the majority operation, you can do much more. So with prototyping, you cannot fully implement what you really want, basically. So that's, that's the point here. So the difficulty in architecture or evaluation is actually more or less is because it is a lot workload dependent. So whenever in, in every domain that you want to simulate or uh, evaluate your design, we are really uh, dependent on the workloads that we are choosing. Like the, for example, about caching, there are some workloads that they are heavily uh, benefit from caching, um, but there are some workloads that they have like streaming memory access patterns such that they don't benefit from cache. Or for example, pipelining, there are some applications that they can, they, they usually, uh, encounter stalls, like there are many branches, for example, in the application, and we cannot uh, have the pipeline full. Or for example, th think about any idea we talk about in this course, like the Raider, SALP, uh, TLDRAM, or many, many other ideas like that. So in the end, uh, not all ideas can work perfectly uh, for all applications. So we have, a, we have different applications and different behavior. So when, whenever we want to evaluate our idea, we need to consider uh, basically the, the variant, uh, various workloads that we have. So, and workloads change, as I said. So, and system has many design choices and parameters. So it's not very easy to um, basically evaluate your system because there are many, many different components in your system. And, uh, and you as a designer, you have many design choices uh, to optimize your system. So your design space exploration is actually quite um, large. And in order to explore this uh, design space, you have to come up with some faster way of evaluating such that you can optimize your system well. So basically architect, uh, architect needs to decide many ideas and many parameters for a design. So that's exactly what, what I mean by design space exploration. So which is not easy to evaluate all possible combinations. And again, system parameters may change as well. So, uh, these are the main reason that why um, architectural evaluation is difficult. And now that's the reason that why how simulation comes to play. And we can actually, uh, can, we can consider simulation as the field of dreams. So by simulation, we can have make some dreaming and uh, test the reality of our dream. So essentially an architect is in part a dreamer, a creator. And simulation is a key tool of the architect that allows the evaluation and understanding of non-existent systems. So you as, a, as an architect, you dream about some design or some improvement or some idea, and you just want to, you, you want to make sure, see that how effective that idea could be. So you can actually implement your dream uh, using a simulator and test it and see how, how much performance or energy uh, you're getting from that idea. And once you are observing that your dream is actually uh, has some reality, then you can actually make it real by implementing the hardware. So 
basically simulation enables the exploration of many dreams, a reality check of the dreams, and deciding which dream is better in the end, which, is, which are good. So these are the good things about simulations. But simulation also enables something that, which is not because of the simulation, is because of uh, people that they are using simulations or simulators. Any guess? Maybe because it's possible to the dreamer, let's say, to create a simulator that uh, doesn't mimic exactly the reality to show that uh, an idea is better than it is. Yeah, and in the end, you can fool yourself. So simulation also enables the ability to fool yourself with false dreams, basically. So if you are not careful about uh, the simulate the simulators that you are using. Uh, or you're not careful with uh, configuration of your simulator, you may end up seeing that, oh, I have this idea and I'm observing like 100 times performance improvement. So let's do it, let's make it. But in the end, uh, that's not how it works. So the true architect actually, or let's say a true researcher, is that once you have an idea, um, you need to first decide which simulator is actually good to use and then try to implement your idea in that simulator and then observe the result. And once you observe a good performance result, now actually your time, um, you, that's the start of your work. You need to understand why your idea is working well. So it's not about, oh, I have good speed up, let's go. So we need to actually think critically about why I'm observing good performance. So that's, uh, that's something that we should always uh, keep in our mind. So why high-level simulation? Uh, the problem is that RTL simulation, which uh, have you guys uh, learned about RTL simulation in any other courses? Like for example, um, using uh, HDL hardware description language programming, you implement your uh, design or hardware or component using, for example, very large language. <laughs> And then you can basically uh, do some simulation at that level. Or you synthesize your code, uh, your very log code to a gate level, and then um, simulate the gate level um, uh, representation of your design. So the thing is that these uh, gate level implementation or RTL level simulation, they are uh, is basically intractable for design and space exploration. The reason is that they are too time consuming to design and evaluate. So coming up with, an, with the correct, actually, uh, and working uh, representation, RTA representation of your design is not easy, honestly. And once you do that, um, it will take a lot of time to, uh, to simulate because you have, so one of the things that uh, affects uh, heavily the, uh, the simulation time is actually the number of components that you have in your simulator. So if you, for example, if you want to simulate a gate level uh, net list of your design, you have too many gates, right? You have too many gates and wires. And simulator essentially needs to track of all these gates and wires. And you can see that it's gonna take a lot of time. But at the, at the high level, for example, you don't have AND gate, but you have, for example, a adder logic. So you know that this is adder and you only uh, consider adder at the high level that, okay, it adds to number, and that's the latency for this ad, for this adder, basically. So you can actually uh, deal with that adder with much, much faster uh, latency. So that, that's, that's the reason that usually RTL simulation is, uh, is too time consuming to design and evaluate. So, and it's getting worse, especially over a large number of workloads when you want to explore different workloads or especially if you want to predict the performance of a good chunk of a workload on a particular design. So you have thousands of workloads and you want to find some workloads that uh, basically get uh, impact from your design, your idea. So you need to, you can 
when you want to predict the performance of them is also getting uh, uh, very time consuming. And especially if you want to consider many design choices. So in the end is about design space exploration and design space exploration across many workloads basically. So when you look at it in that uh, let's say level, you will realize that RTL simulation is not possible. So yeah, like uh, for design choices, as I said, I mean, different design, like cache size, associativity, block size, algorithms, memory control, scheduling algorithms, or for example, in the processor side, you want in order or out of order execution, or regarding the reservation station, how should we size them, the uh, load and store queue size, register file size, and many more. So all these are basically uh, design choices and an architect needs to actually explore them in order to design. So our goal is to explore design choices quickly to see their impact on the workloads uh, we are designing the platform for. So that's uh, the goal for high level simulation basically. Any question? So there are two, uh, let's say different uh, general goals in simulation. One is, as I said, to explore the design space quickly and see what you want to like potentially implement in the next generation platform. So you are simulating something that uh, hopefully we're gonna have in next generation uh, of systems or maybe many uh, also, could be also very foreseen like the 10 years later, 20 years later. So basically that's kind of, uh, uh, I mean, the use cases for the simulation. Or for example, you want to propose uh, as the next big idea to advance the state of the art. So the goal is, uh, is mainly to see relative effects of design decisions. So that's uh, one basically, uh, let's say general goal in simulation. Another uh, goal, which is, uh, I would say quite extreme is that, so we want to match the behavior of an existing system. So whenever I have a working platform, like uh, for example, I have this, uh, SSD. So I want to have a simulator that can um, perfectly and in detail simulate that SSD. So which match completely the behavior of that SSD. And whenever I want to test an idea on that SSD, I can just uh, change the basically simulator and see the effect of that. So it's gonna be, it's not about something that's gonna happen in the future. It's actually about something that we already have. So, it's, uh, there could be different reasons for that. One could be about debugging and verifying it at uh, verifying your idea or your system at cycle level accuracy. Or for example, you want to propose a small tweaks to the design that can make a difference in performance or energy. So for example, uh, the thing I mentioned as an example for SSC could be the second item, for example. You have some idea, you want to make some tweak uh, and test it. So the goal here is actually very high accuracy. So when you have this goal uh, in your simulation, you actually, you need to sh uh, push for high accuracy in your simulator. But for the first one uh, that we want to explore the design space quickly, accuracy is still important, but the speed of simulation is also very important. There are also some other goals in between, like uh, we want to refine the explore design space without going into a full detail cycle accurate design. Imagine that you have like thousands of parameters that you want to explore them, but you want to refine them uh, and pick, let's say 10 important one among, among them and then do the basically uh, detailed and cycle accurate implementation or evaluation or simulation among them. So you can actually uh, have a simulation or high level simulator, which is not perfectly accurate, but it has enough accuracy to let you know that, oh, among all these parameters that you have, uh, these are the most important one. And you just need to focus or care about these parameters. So people are using simulator or high level models sometimes uh, to refine the, uh, the explore design space. And another reason is to gain confidence in your design decisions, which is made by higher level design space exploration. So you, you, get, you gain confidence uh, about your design decisions because usually when we go into the design from the high level, uh, high level of abstraction to lower level, 
we need to spend more time and we, more energy, basically, and more cost. Imagine that uh, from a very, very high level simulator or model, you want to design a simulator that detailed um, model your system. So you need to spend a lot of time. Uh, so you want to basically, uh, or it's better to put it in that way. So you have a, you want to design a new system, right? You want to design a new system or new component. So you have some design decisions. Uh, if you if you want to implement all these design decisions and test them, it's definitely very costly. So you can actually gain some confidence about what are the important or what are the design decisions that they are good. And basically you, again, you can refine or you uh, basically limit the number of design decisions that you have. And, uh, and with the limited set of them, you can actually design your system with, uh, with less cost. Any question? So, but there are, as I, uh, there are trade-offs in simulation. Um, we already uh, seen here also, like if you want to explore the design space quickly, probably the performance, uh, the latency of simulation is quite important. For this second one, accuracy. So we have some uh, basically metrics to evaluate a simulator. One for sure is the speed, how fast a simulator can simulate your, uh, your machine or your design. For example, because a cycle, uh, like uh, one, for example, one second uh, in a real evaluation or real uh, um, runtime can take like three orders of magnitude higher uh, in a simulation. So it takes time to simulate what can be done actually in a second uh, in a real uh, system. So you know, we, we need to actually work on the speed of simulators such that we can explore uh, design space fast. Flexibility of the simulator is also quite important. So if whenever you want to change your simulator, you want to implement a new idea, how quickly you can actually implement. That's very important. And uh, there are some uh, highly accurate simulators in, in our community, but unfortunately it's very hard to use them to implement new ideas. And whenever uh, you want to basically implement an idea, it's actually a headache uh, to find a sweet spot and where you need to um, basically implement your idea. So flexibility of the simulator is another important metric and accuracy for sure uh, is also another metric. There are also other metrics, for example, uh, develop, uh, simulation developing uh, time, num uh, the number of, I mean, line of, uh, number of line, uh, line of codes in the simulator, but, we want to mostly focus on these three parameters. So speed is, as I said, how fast the simulator runs. Flexibility is how quickly one can modify the simulator to evaluate different algorithms and design choices. And accuracy is how accurate the performance energy numbers the simulator generates are versus a real design simulation, a real design, which is we call it as simulation error. I would also mention here that uh, we have we have two metrics for accuracy. It could be uh, one simulator might not be actually very accurate in uh, pure numbers. So whenever you, for example, you calculate the uh, performance or IPC of your uh, system or your design uh, with your simulator, and, uh, and you will see that uh, the IPC that you calculated from simulator is actually quite different from real hardware, right? So that's bad, that's not very good actually. But some simulators, they are not good at uh, this accuracy, but they are good to show the, the right trend. So for example, if uh, in real hardware, you add another thread uh, to your hardware and you observe that, okay, my performance gets increased by 20%, you will also observe the same thing overall in the simulator. Even though the, the base, uh, they have some offset in the beginning of, uh, I mean, from the numbers or the performance numbers that they report, but in the end, they are showing the same trend. So you, with simulator, you also observe like 20% improvements. So that's also very good. So there are some simulators that they actually work hard to uh, make sure that they show the trend well. So this should be also something that we, uh, we uh, take into account uh, for uh, accuracy. 
So the relative importance of these metrics uh, varies depending on where you are in the design process and what your goal is. So you when, so sometimes when we are in the very at very high level of design, we don't really care about accuracy a lot, and we mostly uh, care about the speed. We want to quickly uh, refine our parameters uh, and refine our design space ex exploration, for example. But once we uh, basically go down to the uh, uh, in, in our design, uh, we we care about accuracy more and more, and flexibility is also important. So in the end. It's important that uh, basically where we, we are in the design process and what's the goal. So people are actually trading off speed, flexibility, and accuracy in the simulator. Like speed and flexibility affect how quickly you can make uh, design trade-offs uh, decisions, but it has accuracy, uh, uh, but it can affect accuracy. Or for example, accuracy affects how good uh, your design uh, trade-offs decision might end up being or how fast you can build your simulator, like the simulator design time. So if you want to, if you want to have a very uh, accurate uh, simulator sometimes, so you need to, as a programmer, as a programmer that uh, design a simulator, uh, you need to spend a lot of time to program your simulator. So basically the, the accuracy uh, limit that we are pushing for uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, affects many uh, design decisions in our uh, simulator. And flexibility also affects how much human effort you need to spend uh, to modify the simulator. So basically, we can trade off between uh, the three to achieve design exploration and, des and decision goals. So it's uh, actually uh, not very possible to have highly accurate, uh, highly fast, let's say, uh, high speed and uh, highly flexible simulator all at the same time. So usually we need to sacrifice one of them for the other two, let's say. <coughs> so uh, the key idea of high level simulation is to raise the abstraction level of uh, modeling to give up some accuracy to enable the speed and flexibility and quick uh, simulator design. So now we are actually making a trade off. We, we are okay to basically uh, to achieve a high speed and flexibility at the price of some accuracy loss. So it has uh, some advantages for sure. It can still uh, make the right trade-off and can do it quickly. So all you need is uh, modeling the key high level factors uh, and you can omit corner case conditions. Basically, uh, yeah. So when we want to omit uh, corner case conditions, it just uh, it shows that basically if your workload or your system is actually somehow sitting a lot in the corner case, um, your simulator uh, accuracy is not that good. But on average, in overall case, mostly our workloads or our system, they are not in the corner case conditions. So you can uh, use uh, that simulator. But that's the thing that we should be aware of that. So whenever we are testing our idea or we are using a simulator, we should know that is that the right simulator for that idea or not? Because there are some ideas that uh, some simulators, they are, uh, simulators are not built to test them, they say, to test those ideas. So, and, and also another thing is that all we need is to get the relative trends accurately, not exact performance number. That's exactly what I mentioned in the previous slide uh, that we were discussing about accuracy. So relative uh, trends is also important. So if we can have uh, basically have a good, show the relative trends accurately, I think uh, that's more than enough. We don't really need uh, exact performance numbers. But it has also a disadvantage. Uh, so it opens up the possibility of potentially wrong decisions. So this, but this is also, as I said, it's not a, it's not a mistake or limitation. It's not, it's not because of that simulator. It's just because of the people that they are using simulator. So we always need to make sure that we know what we are doing and what simulator is doing. That. So for example, in the past, uh, we had simulators for CPUs uh, that we are also going to have a, a few slides for that. Simple Scaler is actually one of the uh, very simple simulator. And it has been used in many, many works in the past. So Simple Scaler. Uh, 
I mean, because of its name also, it was really simple. Um, its memory model was quite simple. So it was considering like the fixed, let's say, uh, memory latency uh, to act to bring data. So you don't care about, for example, row buffer heat. You don't care about the channel conflict. You don't care about the load. You don't care about anything. <laughs> you just say that, okay, whenever I access memory, that's the latency to bring data. So it might work for the workloads that, for example, they are not that memory intensive. But for sure, for the workloads that they are memory intensive and memory bound, this simulator is not going to um, basically generate uh, accurate results. And there has been uh, actually many works in this direction that people use this simulator for basically uh, memory level ideas. And they report, uh, yeah, some numbers, which some of them I would say like garbage numbers because that simulator was not actually designed for such kind of uh, analysis. So we always need to be very careful. And I will, report, I will repeat this sentence um, frequently today because it's in the end, that's the only thing matters to me uh, for the simulation part. Okay, so simulation uh, is actually as a progressive refinement technique. So we have these uh, high level models that's very at uh, a very high level abstraction layer and could be, for example, implemented with high level language like C. Uh, we have also medium level models that has less abstract and then we have low, low level models like RTL with uh, everything modeled and in the end with real design. And there could be also some different other models in between. But uh, this is uh, the thing that in the, in the very top, you start with a very large design space and you will explore that design space uh, fast and you refine your design space. And then uh, while you are going down, you basically uh, limit your, the number of uh, design space uh, parameters and hopefully you can uh, finally reach to real design uh, with a good performance. So as we refine, which means that uh, we go down the above list, abstraction level reduces and accuracy hopefully increases, not necessarily if not careful. So you may actually mess up, for example, in the RTL implementation. Uh, so, but overall, when we go uh, down the above the list, uh, we are expecting higher accuracy in the simulator. And the flexibility is also reducing uh, because yeah, flexibility reduces and uh, speed also likely reduces except for real design. So when, when we go, to, for example, to, uh, to low level models, we have, uh, much, uh, we, we have much less flexibility. It's very hard to uh, change uh, the simulator written at the RTL level. And as I said, it's also getting slower, but except for real design, which is, uh, I mean, when you have your design in a real chip, it's gonna be very fast to test your idea but you need to spend a lot of time to build that real design and a lot of money. So we want to make sure that we do it whenever it makes sense. And essentially uh, uh, we can loop back and fix higher level uh, models. So it's kind of, you know, interactive uh, way of designing. So we may need actually to go back, revisit the higher level models, refine the design space, design space exploration and so on and so forth. So basically a good architect is comfortable at all levels of refinement, including the extremes. And a good architect knows when to use what type of simulation. And that's exactly uh, my main point in this lecture. And I would say that more generally, what type of evaluation method? So recall that we have a variety of evaluation methods like theoretical proof, analytical modeling, simulation, prototyping, and real implementation. And basically, a good architect should understand that which, at uh, every point, which simulator makes more sense or which uh, uh, way of or method of evaluation makes sense. For example, when you want to, when you want to show, show that uh, this design is secure, you really cannot show the secure, uh, security of your design by simulation because there could be some corner cases that makes your design insecure, you know? So people are actually looking for proof that show that this design is secure, for example. Or for example, for the, in the uh, lecture that we had yesterday, Interconnect, there was a part that we discussed about deadlock. 
and I and I mentioned that there are some routing algorithms that they are deadlock free, right? So all these algorithms, they actually they have a proof why they are deadlock free. We cannot test them on a real, I mean, on a simulation and say that oh, I test like thousands of thousands of workloads and I haven't observed any deadlock. But who knows? I mean, if if there one algorithm is not deadlock free, the deadlock can occur basically. So. There, it makes sense for some actually uh, ideas or some things that we actually prove them. But for, for other things, it makes sense to use only analytical modeling. Sometimes we need to simulations, prototyping. So in the end, uh, you as an as a architect should understand actually uh, which uh, method we should use. Any question or any thoughts? So there are some general issues in uh, architectural simulation. Like, uh, so uh, basically it derives many design choices and uh, what simulator to build and use, like accuracy, flexibility, and speed. And there are many possible goals as discussed earlier, like entire system performance estimation, component performance estimation. Sometimes you don't uh, really, you don't want to estimate the performance of the whole system. You just want to estimate the performance of your component, like the cache, storage, or interconnect, for example. But sometimes you want to see that if you, for example, if you devise an idea at the interconnection level, and you basically reduce the average packet latency, you want to see the effect of that reduced average packet latency on the overall performance, right? So you need to have a system or somehow you need to evaluate the, the full system kind of that has interconnect and core and memory basically and show that show the effect of that uh, reduced packet latency on overall performance. So other goals could be profiling for statistics and basically, and et cetera. So, there are, uh, let's say, uh, four high-level questions that we can ask when, whenever we want to do simulation. One is that what components are full system, which I already mentioned, or is it going to be a program or traces? So sometimes uh, we don't simulate the whole program um, because simulating program meaning that you need to uh, run the executive, executable file of that program on your simulator. But sometimes you just want uh, to run a trace of that program. So for example, you uh, keep the trace of that pro memory accesses of that program, or you keep the trace of interconnect accesses of that program. And essentially you use those traces. Uh, I guess you're gonna also learn about traces in uh, Ramulator 2, um, which I mean, we also use traces in Ramulator 1 as well. Another question is that how do you simulate it? So there are many choices like functional versus timing, uh, so it, the functional simulation, we only uh, simulate the high level uh, function of our simulation. I mean, how uh, different components, they work. But in timing level, we care about the latency, for example, of every component. So functional simulators, they are fast, but essentially they cannot give you numbers like the performance number, more or less. You need some timing uh, simulator to calculate the latency. Or your simulator could be event driven or cycle by cycle. So I think MQSIM is event driven, right, Rakesh? So you're gonna learn about event driven. And uh, I don't know, Ramulator is event, is cycle by cycle. So perfect. You're gonna see uh, the two examples today. So I'm not going over them now. And essentially, uh, we also, uh, about the state maintenance and recovery, there are many things that uh, we need to know about how do you simulate and uh, where do you simulate so it could be software um, or using some hardware accelerated so if your simulator is going to be a software code that run on a like a multi-core processor or you're going to have some accelerator for your simulator and when do you do things in simulation so for example this oracle information is quite important uh, versus execute like a real machine. Uh, wh whenever you are designing or you are developing ideas, sometimes you want to see a gap or a room for performance improvement. So in such cases, we usually uh, interested in kind of some idea that they are Oracle. 
that basically we know the access pattern. Let's, let's consider, um, for example, cash replacement policy. So in, a, in our Oracle design, for example, we can know all the access patterns that can come in the future. And at every point that you need to evict a cash block, you know uh, which one is the best to choose, right? So it should be possible in the simulation, but it's not possible in the real system because you don't know about the future, right? But it's important to Oracle uh, simulation because that shows the room for improvement, basically. So if you, for example, check different papers that they are trying to improve a topic or a component in a system, they usually have an Oracle or ideal design uh, evaluation. So every simulator has uh, inputs and outputs, but this could be, this is very generalized. Um, so inputs could be program binary, like you basically input the binary code of that program to run, but it could be also system state or checkpoint. Sometimes you want to, uh, you simulate a, a big system and, and a system has, can have many components like the, the OS, different cores, memory, storage, or could be also in a, in a cloud or can be many, many different uh, also systems that they are also connected to each other and communicate. So it's very hard actually uh, to simulate everything at the binary level. So sometimes we actually start the simulation at some checkpoint. So you, you basically input the simulator, the checkpoint of the system state, like the what we have inside the memory, what, uh, what, is the, 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 uh, what we have inside the OS, like the tables of in the OS, and things like that. And then you can start your uh, simulation after that. So it actually has been used in many uh, simulators in order to accelerate uh, the simulation. So this uh, system state or checkpoint, as I said, it could include OS, memory, devices, storage, network, and so on and so forth. So as an output, uh, your simulator can output some functional uh, things like program results. So when you run your uh, basic application on a functional mode of your simulator, you can actually calculate the results of that program. You can, for example, do a functional simulation on, let's say, on adder logic, and see that, okay, your other logic is doing add addition. And also you can uh, calculate, you can have some statistics about functional execution. For example, in your, in your application, you can calculate the number of addition, multiplication, floating point operations. You can calculate the number of these operations essentially, or number of branches, for example. But there are some outputs that they are timing related, like the execution time of each program. So these are, related to timing, or for example, system throughput of all programs, or a statistics about timing and performance events. So all these are timing related and you actually need to work with the simulators that they are timing. And the state of the art simulators, they are actually mostly have this uh, functional and timing uh, part together. So it could be actually, uh, so a part of simulator could be functional, which also has been called uh, as emulation as well. So when you emulate your system, you don't really uh, care about detailed timing of that system. You just want to emulate and show that basically how this uh, system works at the functional level. But there is also a backend of uh, simulators that they usually do the timing uh, part of that. So there are uh, some general issues in architecture simulation, like so functional versus timing simulation. So purpose would be when or why uh, functional versus timing. So I, I gave you some insight uh, in the previous uh, slide. Or integration of functional and timing simulation. We're going to see briefly about that, how we can combine functional and timing simulation together. Or uh, do we need full system or component uh, simulation? So full system simulators, they are accurate, but they are very slow. But they're also, but component simulations, they're faster. But the thing is that whenever you simulate a component, it's very hard to uh, see the effect of that component or your improvement on total system um, performance or energy. So that's the reason that sometimes we need to actually go and use actually full system simulators. <laughs> Or for example, what should we, we model with our simulator? So if we want to, for example, model operating system, virtual memory, 
memory allocator and all these components, we have to use full system. So uh, to see the effect of all of them. Or we basically simulate complete workload or we do some sampling based simulation. So usually we cannot actually uh, simulate complete workload because it's very time consuming. Imagine your workload uh, is gonna take like uh, two days in real hardware. And in simulation, it's gonna take like uh, 2000 days, which several years, right? So uh, clearly we cannot wait like that, right? So we don't really uh, simulate the whole workload. And most of the time we limit the number of execution, limit the, the, the amount of, uh, or the execution, sorry, simulation time uh, by the number of, for example, instructions. So people stop uh, simulating once they reach, for example, 1 billion uh, instructions. Or could be, we can do it also more intelligently. We can make some sample. So we know, for example, from the, before uh, starting the execution uh, or simulation, we know that uh, our workload or our code has some region of interest. So you can actually simulate those region of interest. And once one region of interest is done, you actually skip. You, you emulate, let's say, you emulate the, after that, you don't go to, into the timing uh, simulation because timing is quite slow. So basically you go fast after that region and then the beginning of the next sample, which is, or another region of interest, you start uh, going, uh, simulating the timing, uh, uh, timing simulation. So that's uh, one way to do sampling uh, based simulation. Or for example, should uh, warm up of simulated structures. So this is also quite important. So do we want to simulate steady state or cold start? So the, for caches, for example, when you want to simulate them and you your cache is cold, so you will uh, observe many compulsory misses, right? The cold misses. And once you are, for example, you warm up, then you can actually observe conflict misses, capacity misses, and so on. So sometimes actually we really want to simulate cold start. So we know, and we want to do that. But uh, in many cases, actually we care about steady state. And uh, one of the things that uh, Rakesh actually will also uh, explain in MQC, which is the, the simulator that we have developed for SSD, is actually we, we observe that many uh, prior simulators or other SSD simulators, they don't have this steady state simulation. And uh, as a result of that, there have been many, many works uh, that they show improvement uh, on SSD just because they are using simulators and that simulator was, was kind of cold to start. So in MQC, for example, we have a preconditioning state that makes this steady state. And uh, in order to make it possible that we do simulation on SSD. Or in, for example, uh, let's say workload also execution, you can consider several iterations in the beginning as a warm-up period. So you just, uh, you do some simulation, but you basically trash all the results that you have. But you do, do that to warm up your simulator and then basically continue your simulation. So this is a, a simple scaler, uh, which I mentioned, for example. Uh, yeah, it has been uh, used a lot in the past. It was very, very simple. So I don't want to go into detail of that, but for example, uh, it has this, for example, seem fast that you can see that uh, the number of codes was only 420 lines and uh, it has no timing, but uh, with seem safe, uh, they, uh, sorry, with seem uh, profile, they add more uh, lines of code and a lot of stats. In with seem cache, they added this cache stats but in the end, the simulator was not that complicated, which was good. I mean, in order to test uh, some ideas quickly, this simulator has been used a lot. I remember uh, when I was uh, studying computer architecture in my school, uh, the first project uh, I did was using simple scaler. So on that time, actually, it was quite uh, common also. But yeah, as I said, uh, it wasn't uh, the memory model of simple scaler was not that accurate. And that was one of the reasons that this simulator should not uh, have been used uh, for, for the workloads that they are, let's say, memory intensive. But essentially, when you have these functional and timing uh, simulators, we can actually combine them somehow. And there are many choices. 
So the, the, this is a nice uh, paper. If you are interested, you can take a look in uh, Sigmetrics 2002. But uh, I will only explain like the, the first, uh, the functional first and timing directed part. I'm not going to timing first. Uh, you can uh, basically learn it if you are interested uh, from the paper. But basically uh, with functional first is that uh, whenever, uh, so you want to basically do your simulation, you start with functional simulation. And uh, so the functional simulation, let's say it loads the executable file of your application. And for example, you have uh, your application has, uh, has one, let's say addition instruction, add instruction. So then the function knows that, okay, I need to do addition. But there should, uh, it also calls the timing part of your simulator, which is the backend of simulator such that it can also simulate the addition logic and basically to show the, to calculate the performance or latency of that operation. Or for example, you have this uh, memory operation. At the function level, you only care about the memory load instruction. You only care about the value that you're going to do, right? But uh, for the, after the function uh, basically running that load instruction, it will also invoke the timing uh, basically part of simulator to calculate, basically to simulate that load instruction. So it's gonna, for example, access the L1 cache. If it's a heat, then we have some latency. If it's a miss, we need to access, for example, L2. So we have another latency. So basically that timing part needs to model your hardware um, performance, essentially. And, uh, and this timing and function could be also interactive. Uh, interactive. So they can also make, uh, give input to each other. For example, uh, at the function level, you have this, um, let's say, uh, thread scheduler, and you want to decide which thread I should pick next. Like you are, for example, simulating multi-threaded uh, uh, execution. At the function level, you want to know that which thread I should execute, right? So we, we need to consider this thread uh, scheduling effect. And in order to do that, you need to understand that which thread is actually active or which thread is not. So imagine that threads are making and uh, having different instructions. At the timing, uh, we will realize that, okay, this load instruction from thread A is gonna be a miss. So this thread is gonna stall for a while. So timing can actually let uh, function part know that, oh, this thread is gonna be stalled for a while, so don't schedule it for now. So basically feedback uh, from timing to the function uh, simulator, which, so in literature, actually, they call that also front-end and back-end in the simulators also. So there are some simulators that they call it as a front-end and back-end. So if you have seen that also, that's more or less the same. But yeah, I mean, if you're interested, I would uh, encourage you to check this paper. Um, this is, for example, a fast simulator of a, a parallel computer system, which uh, using a functional first model. And essentially it has this functional model and timing model. And there are some cues and commands going between them, uh, which we already discussed also. <coughs> so there are some general issues in architecture simulation, like the validation of accuracy, like a functional accuracy versus timing uh, accuracy, or it could be online versus offline validation. There are some simulators that we, need, we uh, validate uh, their accuracy offline and then we use them. But there could be also, this validation can also happen online um, in some cases. Or for example, simulation acceleration. Uh, how can we accelerate simulators? Because I mean, in general, actually simulation is a slow um, and it's important to accelerate it. So there are some works that they try to use uh, hardware support like the FPGA or using some software methods like memoization, for example, to accelerate the software or using a, uh, in general, it's, it's a good idea to, you, uh, to have better software engineering. So I have a, for example, comment here. For uh, um, there is a, a very nice, uh, let's say, uh, I mean, widely used simulator for GPU, uh, which, I mean, GPU, GPU sim, and then um, also this state of thought Excel sim. But even though GPU is an architecture which is highly parallel, so there are many, many threads running in that GPU, but the simulator itself was single threaded. So there was one thread in that simulator that has to you know, basically mimic all the execution of all threads 
that's running in that simulator. So, and I, essentially GPGPU, I mean, uh, the experiment that I was doing with that simulator was quite slow. I remember I was waiting, for example, for three days for one run, for example, to, to, to have the result. And that was only for, let's say one billion or one, uh, I don't know, one million instructions, something like that. So the simulation is very important to have better software engineering in general. And I would say that, for example, GPGPU uh, simulation of that can benefit a lot from multi-trading because the nature of that is also multi-traded. So access sim is actually uh, improved a lot on the front end of that simulation. It's not uh, uh, doing multi-traded as far as I know. Okay, so another uh, issue is that using trace-driven versus execution-driven simulation. So sometimes you input a trace uh, to your simulator uh, that, as I said, could be trace of memory accesses, could be trace of, uh, also could be trace of architectural uh, or microarchitectural execution, or could be execution driven that you, for example, input the binary file of your application. So both have been used and uh, depending on the basically use case and the level of that simulator, uh, we can use them. So, and also to continue, like uh, we want to execute at front end versus execute at execute. So is execution done only in functional simulator or in the timing simulator as well? For some uh, parameters or for some simulation, we can actually only rely on the execution that has been done at front end. But there are some execution that they are timing dependent, as I said, uh, like the uh, like trade scheduling. So which is a timing dependent execution that becomes harder if execution is done only in the front end. And, and we need to uh, do, uh, make some connection between timing simulator and, uh, and uh, basically the backend and frontend. So examples are, let's say that multi-traded uh, execution, which I mentioned, or for example, value prediction of L2 misses. So whenever you have uh, L2 cache access, uh, so you want to uh, basically predict a value to, in order to, uh, get rid of that miss penalty. So if you predict that value nicely and correctly, you can actually continue. But if you predict that value wrong, you need to actually go back to the uh, timing uh, simulator and do the, all this uh, access to the DRAM and so on and so forth. So basically uh, the, the connection between timing uh, simulator and uh, functional simulator is very important. And the state maintenance and recovery, so modeling of mispredicted execution, like, like wrong pass, wrong values, and even driven versus cycle by cycle pooling. So usually simulators that they are even driven, they are faster, uh, but actually very, it's also very hard to design. Uh, cycle by cycle is uh, uh, relatively slower, I would say. I mean, but it, it also depends on the case. But uh, but they are easier to reason about. So you know you know this this cycle, uh, and that cycle can be a synchronization point, and you basically increase cycle by cycle, and you go in through the uh, uh, basically you run your application. So as an example simulator, um, this one emulator uh, that we published in, uh, in, basically we released uh, the simulator in 2015. Uh, so we designed the simulator as a fast and extensible DRAM simulator. It's actually the version of uh, Ramulator 1, which I'm explaining briefly here, but uh, how soon we'll discuss Ramulator 2 um, just after this uh, part of lecture. So in, uh, there are uh, so, some motivation beyond Ramulator. So DRAM and memory controller landscape is changing and uh, many new and upcoming standards, also many new controller designs. So a fast and easy, easy to extend simulator is very much needed. And for example, in this table, you can see that uh, we have different, I mean, on that time at least, different commodity, uh, let's say, uh, standard like DDR3, DDR4. For low power, we have this LPDDR3, LPDDR4. For graphics, we have GDDR5. For performance, we had this EDRAM, 
uh, or alert DRAM. Also, we had this 3D stack memory like HBM, HMC. And in academic also, we had many, many works like SALP, um, Stage uh, Reads, TLD RAM, Row Clone, Raider, and so on and so forth. So there has been many, many designs. And uh, it's, important to, uh, it's important that we able to test them and see the effect of them. So that was the, the main motivation behind, uh, behind this emulator. So emulator provides out-of-the-box support for many DRAM standards. Uh, for example, as, I, as you can see in this uh, in this slide, like DDR3, DDR4, LPDDR, GDDR, HPM, and uh, and basically it provides a two and a half uh, speed of uh, than fastest open source simulator, and it was modular and extensible to different standards. <coughs> So uh, we did some case study um, in, in Ramulator paper, the comparison of different DRAM standards. And uh, this is the, for example, the figure that you can see. Um, for example, you can see that uh, these are, I guess, all uh, normalized to DDR3. So you can see that, for example, uh, DDR4 is uh, achieving better speed up compared to DDR3. This has the minimum and maximum performance. And this, I guess, is the average speed up. Uh, with SALP, uh, we can increase average speed up a bit, but there are some workloads that they can uh, benefit from SALP idea, for example, a lot. With LPDDR3, we basically it reduces the performance, but overall is also not that bad. So basically, such kind of uh, evaluations uh, was not possible uh, in the past because in, in real system, uh, if you want to test the effect of DDR3, for example, if you want to compare DDR3 and DDR4, you actually need to buy two systems. And in the end, because uh, the DRAM um, the standard that connects to the, to the motherboard is different. And in the end, uh, you end up comparing uh, Apple and Orange because your two systems are different. CPUs are different, many components are different. So with this uh, kind of simulation, we can fix uh, at least the uh, simulator, I'm uh, sorry, we can fix, for example, the, the code, the CPU uh, configuration, and just uh, analyze the effect of a memory standard, basically. <coughs> Any question? So yeah, if you're interested, uh, I would suggest that you check uh, this paper. Uh, I think Ramulator 2 is also uh, already out, right? OK. And we, do we have an archive version of that? OK, perfect, perfect. So yeah, you can also see that um, in Ramulator 2 part. So people also use this simulator a lot. And this simulator uh, is free and open source. And it's also important that uh, this simulator, probably you cannot uh, read, it's terrible, but I can read here. <laughs> so it can be actually uh, also connected to Gen5. So Gen5 is a, a full system simulator um, that has been used a lot for to simulate multi-core systems. But in Gen5, we have a memory model, which uh, you can actually uh, integrate the emulator as the memory model of uh, Gen5. And, uh, it actually provides better, uh, more accuracy uh, for, for that simulation. And, uh, and also, uh, the Ramulator is uh, all the results that we uh, show is actually reproducible. And we also show that uh, they're basically reproducing results from paper. So if you are also interested to learn more about uh, Ramulator, there is also this PNS uh, Ramulator course. I'm not sure about the new name of this course uh, because um, you, how soon you are uh, running this course is there, right? This not this semester, but maybe next semester or uh, later. But uh, these, these are the previous edition of this course uh, in fall 2022 or in, in spring 2022 that you can check and uh, learn about this simulator. So you will also review the Ramulator paper. Um, but let's uh, take a look at some example studies using Ramulator. So this one is uh, one of the studies that we did for like the demystifying complex workload DRAM interactions, which was an experimental study. 
So basically, uh, why a study workload DRAM interaction? So the reason that we did that is that manufacturers are developing many new types of DRAM, and DRAM uh, limits performance energy improvements. And memory systems uh, now serve uh, a very diverse set of applications and can no longer take a one size fits all approach. So which DRAM type works best with which application? So that was the, basically the reason that we did this experiment. So, and we perform a wide ranging uh, experimental study to uncover the combined uh, behavior of workloads and DRAM types. Um, like 115 uh, emerging applications and multi-program workloads and we use nine modern DRAM types uh, for this experiment. Which, as I said, it wasn't possible uh, using uh, real devices. And here are, for example, the results that uh, you can see that uh, GDDR Yeah, for example, some of these memory models, they are optimized for bandwidths. Uh, like GDDR5 and HPM, but they are not very good at uh, basically um, latency. So you can see that uh, for some of these benchmarks, we actually observing uh, better performance when we are using faster memory models or memory interface. For some of these benchmarks, we observe better performance when we are using more high bandwidth memory. So basically several applications don't benefit from more parallelism. Uh, and it's important to also have this uh, fast uh, memory interface. So there are uh, several takeaways in this work, uh, which I'm going over them quickly. It's like DRAM latency remains a critical bottleneck for many applications. Bank parallelism is not fully utilized by a wide variety of our applications. And uh, special locality continues to provide significant performance benefits if it is exploited by the memory subsystem. And for some uh, classes of applications, uh, low power memory can provide energy savings without sacrificing significant performance. So yeah, if you are interested about this work, you can actually uh, see the source code on this uh, page. I mean, for the RAM later, and also this is the paper uh, that you can read. But uh, we also use this RAM later, RAM later for many other study like the Block hammer that you, I guess you all know about this. It's a row hammer defense uh, mechanism that Girai um, proposed. So uh, we actually implemented the block hammer in uh, Ramulator. And this is the basically the source code of that. We actually open source uh, block hammer. Yeah, so yeah, and actually there are many, many other ideas that we evaluate with Ramulator and uh, like Lisa, for example, is one of them. I guess you are also again aware of Lisa that uh, basically it adds some transistors to uh, connect uh, different subarrays such that we can uh, quickly copy it, uh, a page, a row from a subarray to another subarray. So with, uh, with Ramulator, actually, we can also implement such ideas as well. So you can actually change a memory model make that connection and uh, show the effect of that and the performance, basically. We also use RAM later for processing memory a lot. Um, uh, the first one was that, that we uh, RAM later extended for PIM, like this uh, flexible and extensible DRAM simulator. So we can model many uh, different memory standards and proposal, but we also uh, combine the, the PIM extensibility uh, Basically, we, uh, we apply PIM on Ramulator. And this is the paper uh, that we use, uh, basically, uh, Ramulator for PIM uh, from Gagan, Naples. Uh, so you can uh, take a look at this paper if you're interested. Uh, and this is, again, the PNS uh, course that we have for Ramulator. There are some other uh, useful simulators uh, that we have. So here is a, some, some of them. but so the list is not complete for sure. Uh, Gen5 is actually, as I said, full system multi-core simulation that has been used a lot. Uh, so when, and it can, it, it has also different modes. It can be heavily full system, which is very slow, but it can be also not that full system, which is faster. But essentially Gen5 is uh, to simulate multi-core uh, systems. MQSIM that Rakesh is gonna discuss is actually for the modern SSD simulator. 
Disk sim uh, was a simulator for hard disk simulation. Uh, Domov sim is actually a simulator for processing near memory uh, simulation that uh, Geraldo developed. So, which is a combination of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Z sim and uh, Ramulator. So, with Domov sim, you can actually implement a processing near memory. Sniper is also another simulator which is uh, for fast processor simulation. So, Sniper made some basically ideas how we can make uh, the multi-core or many-core execution faster. Um, and also there are many other simulators like for detailed microarchitecture simulation or also for full system functional simulation. But there are many more also. So in the end, what you need to do is actually, uh, whenever you are working on a topic, you need to learn about what are the options and decide your simulator basically or choose your simulator wisely. And also at some point you may need to develop your own simulator for your purpose, which we have done actually. Uh, like MQSIM is actually, we were, uh, we were uh, I remember we were uh, quite curious about how uh, SSDs are work. Uh, they work in the presence of uh, multiple applications, like the new SSDs. Like the modern SSDs that we don't, we, we, have, we don't have this IO scheduling layer anymore and things uh, get scheduled uh, inside the storage. Uh, we, we were quite curious about that. And on that time, actually, there were no uh, simulator for SSC that actually uh, do that. And I remember that we developed our simulator, the MQSIM. We develop, we use that for a paper on that time that we publish uh, Flynn, which I already presented that in ISCA 2018. And we also published, released this MQSIM uh, in, uh, in uh, FAST conference. And after that, people have used our MQSIM simulator a lot for their work. We also use MQSIM also. So sometimes you need to actually develop your own simulator. So this is a Domo simulator, uh, which is open source. And this is the paper about that. If you're interested, you can take a look. So yeah, we have also a lot of talks about Domo uh, that you can check. We have also this PIM course uh, as a PNS course that we also uh, uh, presented no move in that course as well. MQC for modern SSD simulation that uh, uh, Rakesh will explain about it in more detail. And basically in our website, there are many more uh, simulators. Like you can see that uh, but, but, but it's not only simulators in the, our website. So we have uh, simulators and uh, implementation of different uh, papers that we have uh, um, basically published. Like for example, this uh, Sparse P is actually uh, a library that implements many uh, SPMV implementation that has a wide range of SPMV, different way of uh, implementing SPMV for op-mem uh, basically uh, processing memory. Or Prim Benchmarks is actually the benchmark suite that uh, Juan, uh, he has uh, developed with, uh, with his co-authors. And uh, this one also the first benchmark suite, real benchmark for real PIM uh, op-mem system. So SoftMC, uh, which later on we have also this DRAM Bender, which is the newer uh, version of that is also for uh, basically understanding uh, DRAM a lot. So you can control the memory controller of your DRAM and you can play with all these uh, timing or signals of, of the DRAM. So the thing is that what we discussed is also applicable to simulations in other domains. Uh, we actually, we have done this study also in, uh, for COVID-19 uh, in the, during that uh, pan pandemic. Uh, so our goal was to actually uh, model and simulate and understand that basically we want to predict the next peak and understand that basically uh, the next peak is gonna be, I mean, how bad is gonna be such that basically uh, hospitals and people related to that, they can make decision that if they need to apply more restrictions or they can reduce the restrictions or something like that. So we actually, we have done this project and uh, we made some, let's say, uh, basically prediction that you cannot also see, but I can read here from you. You said that uh, COVID hunter estimates that we are experiencing a deadly new wave 
that will peak on the last week of uh, January 2022, which is very similar in numbers to the way we had in February 2020. So from the numbers that we had in February 2020, we could predict that uh, another wave is going to happen in January 2022. And unfortunately, as a real outcome, that happened also. Um, so basically, we also mentioned that uh, the, the policy makers have only one choice, uh, that is increasing the strengths of the currently applied mitigation measures for 30 days. Relaxing the mitiga mitigation measures should not be an op option before at least February 2022, as it would increase uh, exponentially the number of cases hospitalization and deaths by 5.5 uh, times. So basically they haven't uh, reduced uh, uh, the restrictions, but they also, they didn't increase. So which we have that uh, basic numbers, but essentially using uh, uh, these uh, simulation modeling, you can make also predictions. And these are some recall about the goals of uh, simulation that I think we don't need to repeat it again. So like the, we want to explore design space quickly and also match the behavior of, of an existing system. There are also some goals in between and trade-off between different simulators like the speed, flexibility, and accuracy and how we make trade-off between, between them. And, uh, and the reason that we need high-level simulation, which we already covered. So, okay, I think uh, we are done with the first part of the lecture. Uh, let's uh, have a nine minutes break and get back here at 45. We're gonna continue by Ramo later too. Thank you.
Hello? Hello? Okay. Um, yes. So I think let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I will be introducing Remulator 2.0 uh, today. So first, my self-introduction. Uh, I'm Hao Song. I'm currently a PhD stu student at Safari. My current research interest is in memory systems and DRAM, and you can reach me by writing an email to this address. Um, so uh, I will be giving an overview of uh, Remulator 2.0. It's a modern, modular, and, extens and extensible DRAM simulator. Um, this is the executive summary of my uh, talk. So let's first start with the motivation on why are, are we building uh, Remulator 2.0. So we need psycho-accurate DRAM simulators to model the detailed operations of the memory controller and the DRAM device. And we also need this to evaluate the uh, performance, energy efficiency, security, et cetera, all of these metrics of the memory system. Um, recently, there are growing research and design efforts to improve uh, the performance, security, and reliability of DRAM-based memory systems. As you already seen, like there are a lot of uh, row hammer mitigations. Uh, therefore, we need a tool which can enable rapid and agile implementation and evaluation of all these new designs and ideas. The second motivation, um, there are problems with existing DRAM simulators that we observe. And uh, the most important of uh, all of those are that they are not modeling the memory system in a fundamentally modular and extensible way. So there, uh, the first common issue is that a lot of the simulators, they're not separating the logic of the memory controller, let's say the uh, request, uh, the memory request scheduler from the behavioral and timing model uh, of the DRAM device. A second issue is that a lot of them lack a concise and intuitive way to specify, uh, to implement DRAM specifications. And as, Mah as Muhammad already covers, uh, computer ar architecture simulators is all about exploring the design space. So if you couldn't provide a way to easily modify the configuration or parameters of your system, it will not be very easy to use. And yeah. So our goal here is to provide an easy to use modular and extensible software infrastructure for rapid and agile implementation and evaluation of DRAM related research and design ideas. So to this end, uh, we envision the simulator should have a modular and extensible software architecture such that if we want to change the functionality of, uh, let's say, one component, then we should not uh, be bothered with changing the code of other unrelated components. And the simulator should also facilitate uh, easy modification uh, of the DRAM specifications. By specifications, I mean yeah, the organization of the DRAM, uh, what commands the DRAM standard supports, and what are the timing constraints between commands? And these are uh, the common parameters that we uh, are always changing and evaluating when uh, working with DRAM. And to do so, we require an intuitive way and concise way to, de to define and implement uh, these uh, specifications. Uh, and third, although not shown here, we hope that um, the new simulator, uh, by having a nice software architecture, we can uh, basically always update it when we have some new projects, implement some new ideas. We always update uh, a single code repository that contains our previous work. And by doing so, we can enable easier reproduction and comparison with uh, the prior works. So this will make everyone else's life much easier that they don't have to port uh, the, uh, the design and ideas from other works to their own simulator. Yeah. And now I will introduce the key design features of Ramulator 2.0. Um, I won't go into like too much low level uh, detail or show too much code in this lecture. If you're interested, you can always go to the code repository. We have a uh, tutorial there that basically guides you through how to uh, understand the code design or how to extend Ramulator 2.0 by adding your own uh, components there. Yeah, so first, uh, yeah, let's have a quick overview of Ramulator 2.0. So uh, 
So it's a fundamentally modular and extensible software framework. And we model every component in the memory system uh, by an abstract interface and uh, many different concrete implementations. Um, we implement a concise and human readable way to implement uh, DRAM specifications. And uh, you can define those very intuitively with just uh, string literals as you would call them or find them in the JDEX spec. So they're more easy, uh, they're easier to understand and modify. Uh, we also implement a bunch of most new and node DRAM standards. We implement a variety of row hammer mitigation techniques. And while doing all of those above, we still maintain a, a fast simulation speed by leveraging some C++ uh, 20 features. And Ramlin 2.0 can work either as a standalone simulator or be used as a memory system library uh, by let's say a full system simulator, let's say Gem5. Yeah, we have the public version hosted uh, in the GitHub repo here. So now let's take a look at uh, how does Ramulator implement the uh, modular and extensible software framework. Uh, so to, uh, as a recap, we uh, our goal is to build a modular and extensible simulator such that if we want to modify or change the functionality of one component, we shouldn't be bothered with code changes of unrelated components. So the way we do this is we completely decouple um, how a component interacts with other components in the system from the actual functionality of its own. And um, to this end, we uh, model every component in Ramlet 2.0 with two key concepts as shown here. So first is an interface, it's an abstract C++, uh, C++ that um, models the common high level behavior of a component as seen by the other components in the system. Uh, the second is the implementation. It's a concrete C++ class, uh, sorry, C++ class that inherits the set interface and actually provides the concrete implementation uh, of the actual functionality of the component. So let's see an uh, example system configuration with interfaces and implementations of a memory system. So here we show an example system. Uh, um, we show an example memory system configuration uh, that uses uh, DDR5 main memory. Um, uh, I think you, you can see the the, uh, the laser pointer here, right? Okay. So here we have the uh, legend. The uh, dark boxes at the top. They are the interface uh, that in interfaces. And the uh, white box above them are the instantiated uh, implementation for the in, uh, for the uh, in interface. And as you can see, the uh, we have all the typical components in the memory system here. So we have uh, uh, the most the two most important ones, or the two uh, ones at the top level of the uh, entire uh, system, are a simulation front end. It's responsible for generating memory requests uh, from either, let's say, a trace file, or in this case, it captures the memory request from Gem5 and translates in, it into the memory request format of Ramulator. And uh, then the front end will be responsible for sending those memory requests to the uh, memory system. So the memory system is an encapsulation of everything in the uh, memory systems, which is basically uh, everything else. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, as, and as, uh, as mentioned before, Ramulator 2.0 is still a cycle uh, by cycle simulator. So we have to tick every component. And when the front end is ticked, it gets the memory request. It sends the memory request to the uh, memory system interface. And the memory system implementation will, uh, uh, will perform an address mapping. Uh, basically, it's translating the physical address from the OS to a DRAM address, for example, which channel, which rank, which bank, which row, which column, um, by calling the map function of the address mapper interface. Uh, then it will um, uh, enqueue this uh, memory request after the address translation to the DRAM controller. 
So that's what uh, happens basically at the front end of the simulation that we receive a memory request and send it to the uh, actual uh, memory system that contains the memory controller and the DRAM device model uh, as shown here on the right side of, uh, of the plot. So in the memory system, uh, the two most uh, important components are the memory controller and the DRAM device model, which contains both the behavioral and timing uh, m uh, m modeling of the DRAM. And uh, of course, there's also uh, some other components uh, from the uh, memory controller, let's say the memory request scheduler uh, and a refresh manager for DRAM. So once the um, request arrives at the uh, uh, the memory controller, and when the memory controller is ticked, uh, first it will take the refresh manager, and let's say for uh, for example we have the conventional all bank all bank refresh here, then the all bank refresh implementation will be responsible for sending refresh commands back to the command queue or the uh, 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 sorry the request queue of the uh, memory controller if uh, its internal uh, like counter has decided that it's time to send a, a, a refresh. Second, it will call uh, the memory controller implementation will call the uh, request scheduler asking for, okay, which request is the best that I can schedule according to your uh, scheduling policy. So this uh, request scheduler after receiving this uh, demand from the memory controller, it will first decode the request into a DRAM command based on both the current state of the DRAM device and the scheduling policy. And once it gets the uh, uh, command, uh, it will uh, perform its own scheduling lo uh, a logic. Let's say if we have an FR FCFS, first ready, first come, first served sch uh, scheduling policy, then this uh, scheduling policy check in, uh, involves checking if the uh, DRAM command for the picked request is ready or not. And this check ready function, it involves querying the uh, state and timing constraints of the DRAM device to decide, okay, uh, has all the timing constraints be satisfied so that uh, we can uh, actually issue this DRAM command. Once the scheduler has checked all the candidate requests, uh, it will pick the, uh, the command from the best request to schedule according to its uh, sch uh, scheduling policy. Then the Memory controller, once it got the best command to uh, from the scheduler, it will issue the command, uh, which will update the state and timing information of the DRAM device model. And um, yeah, and uh, sorry. And finally, uh, if there are any completed request, the memory controller will call the callback of, of the request, which basically not, uh, notifies the front end that yeah, this request has been uh, served by the memory system and the front end should proceed with uh, the rest of the, uh, like the responsibility of the memory request. For, uh, for example, fill the cache and notify upper levels of the cache. So the output is a bunch of statistics. Yeah. So the output is a bunch of statistics of course, including the number of cycles, the, uh, the number of instructions retired by the front end, et cetera. So yeah, you will need to uh, find what statistics are interesting to you and get those. Also, we have a uh, relatively straightforward framework to allow you to easily add or modify what kind of statistics you want to collect and automatically print at the end of the simulation. So you can refer to the uh, repo for more details on this. Thank you.
So, so now we have, um, so seems like we uh, can model things by interfaces and implementations. And um, yeah, as we said before, there are a lot of ideas, a lot of different designs in the memory system. So there, there's a nat, uh, natural question that how to efficiently manage all the interfaces and, and implementations. Certainly you, you don't want to spend a lot of time writing boilerplate code just to instantiate many different um, uh, components. And if you have checked the source code of Ramulator 1.0, you will see that like probably the majority of the lines of code in the uh, main.cpp entry point is like a huge cascade of if statements that instantiates different uh, DRAM uh, standards uh, manually, which yeah, is not something that we, we uh, ideally want. So yeah, to solve this, uh, Ramulator 2.0, it implements a self-registering factory uh, to keep track of all the interfaces and their implementations. What this uh, thing achieves is that um, the software framework of Ramulator 2.0 can automatically instant, uh, instantiate uh, components by the names of their interfaces and implementations as you specify in the configuration file and you don't have to write any boilerplate code on your own. Yeah, and if you want more details on this, you can check the repo and there's a tutorial there. And then let's take a look at another interesting feature. Uh, we call it memory controller plugins. So the memory controller, it has a lot of responsibilities. Um, uh, so it, it's responsible for decoding the memory requests into the actual DRAM commands based on the current state and timing constraint of the, uh, of the DRAM device. It will schedule memory requests based on the scheduling policy, and it will perform maintenance and bookkeeping duties, let's say sending periodic refreshes. So the memory controller is indeed where like a lot of uh, extra functionalities could be implemented. Let's say for, uh, for example, many of our uh, row hammer mitigation te uh, techniques, they require some added functionalities in the memory controller. Let's say they want to keep track of and record what are the, uh, like the most activated D, uh, uh, DRAM rows that could become aggressor rows. And second, when we are uh, doing the simulation, we usually implement a lot of utility functions in the memory controller that basically uh, overlooks the um, issued DRAM commands. I said two, two very typical use cases are, so yeah, we want to collect some performance statistics uh, and give feedback to the system. So the, the, uh, maybe the uh, system can uh, tune and optimize some of its own parameters so that it can perform better, improve fairness or save energy. So this is also what uh, Lab 5 is about. So our Lab 5 is about designing, uh, 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 sorry, implementing two fairness oriented memory scheduling policies and sure that will uh, involve a way to monitor the current, let's say performance fairness statistics of the uh, system. And this is what these things can come in handy. So if you are, if you decide to work on Lab 5, maybe you can think about can the required uh, functionalities be, be implemented like in this way? And yeah, of course, a second very common use case is to provide insights for post simulation analysis. Let's say you can, uh, yeah, uh, as, as Muhammad mentioned, um, we want to count, let's say, how many instructions are, uh, are executed in total. Uh, so similarly, in the memory simulator, we also want to see uh, how many activations are issued, how many pre-charts are, are issued, how many refreshers are issued, and that's a, sometimes a, 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 a very fast way to identify performance uh, issues or reason about why does, your, uh, why does the performance of your uh, system change. So it, uh, then the question is like, yeah, because like these functions, they are a lot, but they don't affect the basic duties of the memory controller. So does it make sense to have a different memory controller implementation for every single of these 
small extra functionalities? And the natural answer is just no. So uh, we designed a memory controller plugging interface for a generic DRAM controller implementation such that all your, like these extra small functionalities can be implemented there without having to uh, have a different, or let's say slightly different memory control Im uh, implementation every time. So, um, yeah, so he, uh, here we have the, uh, the high level uh, uh, system architecture as before, and the plugin lies uh, in between here. Uh, so it's between the uh, DRAM command returned by the scheduler. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's after the request uh, scheduler picked the DRAM command to be issued and be, uh, before the D, uh, DRAM command is actually issued to the DRAM device model. Yeah, sure. Why this mic is not coming on? Is it on? It's working, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's working, yeah. Okay. So I think uh, the address map. Uh, is the address mapper uh, uh, you have mentioned, right? Address map, the address mapping scheme of the DRAM chips, is it open source? Uh, for some of the... So, so for some of the processors, the vendors, they publicize the address mapping scheme in their data sheet. But for some, they don't. But there are ways to reverse engineer. Um, and also, uh, uh, basically, yeah, if you really want to like have a super accurate uh, implementation, what you can do is you can uh, basically observe the issued DRAM command sequence and their addresses and compare that with uh, the data captured by, let's say a logic analyzer uh, on a real system with a processor that you want to reverse engineer the memory uh, mapping function of. And th yeah, that's also a way. And uh, you can take a look at the drama paper. So they propose a methodology to reverse engineer the bank functions uh, so that people can use it to craft row hammer attacks or evaluate mitigations. Yeah, there are always ways you can take a look at those. And I don't think that's the responsibility of a simulator. So of course a simulator could not reverse engineer the mapping for you, right? You, you, you have to implement your own map. Yeah. Thank you. Now let's take a deeper look at this um, controller plugin. So we have an example plugin implementations here uh, that we uh, implement many different row hammer mitigation techniques that involves functionalities in the memory controller. Uh, uh, let's say para, it will, uh, so um, yeah, the uh, generic controller implementation, it calls the update function of the plugin interface with the parameters being the, the UM command issued and the address. Let's say, yeah, for uh, the para implementation, it will check if the incoming command is an activation, then it will basically roll the dice to uh, see if I should probabilistically issue a refresh command or yeah, in Paris case, it, it's an activation to refresh the potential victim rows caused by this activation. And for graphene, TR and Hydra, they, they, they can also check, yeah, if it's an activate command, uh, we, we will query and update its own row activation count table and uh, compare with the address here and see if we need to increase the activation count or not. And if the activation count exceeds the threshold, then they will uh, enqueue a victim row refresh command back to the uh, uh, memory controller. 
So that's how many different row hammer mitigations can be can all be implemented as uh, memory control plugins. Yeah, and with this uh, functionality and this interface, you can also easily implement utilities that will be very helpful when you are debugging and developing your designs in RAM later 2.0. Let's say you can easily write your plugin to dump the DRAM command trace because you have the command and address here. You can also count the total number of each commands and you just count. So yeah, we think it's a very useful thing to have. Uh, next, I will briefly talk about uh, concise and intuitive DRAM sp uh, specifications. So the DRAM behavioral and timing models in RAM Router 2.0 are based on finite state machines and we implement them by many different lookup tables. So if we want to, uh, so yeah, the, the, the process of defining these specifications, let's say the organization, the DRAM commands, the mapping between the commands and the organization levels and the timing constraints, they're essentially like filling up like these many different lookup tables. So in order to make this easy to understand and modify, so we should have um, basically an easy way to uh, automatically fill the, like those a lot of tables without runtime overhead. And we, sh we would also like to maintain modularity and extensibility by doing so. So we have three key implementations to achieve the goal. First, we implement data structures that allows you to define DRAM specifications using human readable string literals. Let's say here we have an example of how you can define different organization levels, different DRAM commands, and what is the scope of the DRAM commands. By scope, I mean like, yeah, what is uh, the level in the organization hierarchy that your DRM command is targeting. Let's say for an activation, it's, on, it's at a row level, and for a uh, pre-charge, it's at bank level. So these string literals, they are const evaluated within the DRM uh, uh, behavioral and timing model. So there's no runtime overhead by using these string literals, but yeah, they significantly improve the readability. And second, these uh, things, they can be dynamically queried by the string literals, uh, by other components in the system through the DRAM interface. Uh, by doing so, we achieve high modularity such that the other components in the system can know about the capabilities or the specifications of the DRAM when they are uh, in, uh, initialized. Let's say, for, uh, for example, when you have your row hammer mitigations, you certainly want to know about uh, how many rows are there, how many banks are there, et cetera, so that you, you, uh, you can configure your, uh, the parameters of your mitigation uh, accordingly. Second, we implement way to define the timing constraints based on permutations. And we, we spend some time to make it also more human readable. So this, uh, the uh, definition here simply translate that, yeah, currently we are defining that at the bank level, the minimum time interval from any commands in the preceding uh, DRAM commands container to any of the uh, following commands uh, is an RCD amount of cycles. So th uh, th uh, this means that, yeah, uh, after an activation at the bank, the next read command must be issued at least in our CD cycles after the activation. And, uh, and the same goes for the write command. And by just writing this down, they will be automatically uh, added to the internal lookup table. So you, you don't have to fill them on your own. Third, we have a reusable library of uh, DRM command implementations. Let's say here we uh, implement uh, the uh, pre-charge uh, all bank uh, DRAM commands that closes all the DRAM banks. So we call this like it's a require all bank closed function. And this function is used by uh, many different DRAM standard as a prerequisite of basically all the all bank series of DRAM uh, 
uh, uh, uh, commands. Then we uh, we don't have to write this for every single DRM standard. We just uh, like fill the lookup table by the uh, specialized version of this uh, DRM command template. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay, now let's take a look at an example use case of Ramlitter 2.0 uh, by comparing the uh, performance overhead of many different Roheim mitigation techniques. So we implement six different Roheim mitigation techniques all as memory controller plugins as we, yeah, please. So um, basically, if if we consider that you said that it's n r uh, t r c d cycles after that that you can specify. So if let's say I change my DRAM design, and in that let's say I specify that it's it's a bigger design as compared to a DDR four design. So can it automatically calculate what should be the t r c d values? So you have to set the TRCD values. So uh, from the specification sheet itself, we have to specify what should be the TRCD values. Yes. It cannot, right now it cannot calculate itself from the memory design or with the RC models. So you, you, you can calculate, but how good it is depends on the, let's say, the, your circuit level DRAM model. Okay. Okay. Previously, did you evaluate Rohammer? How did so the 2014 Rohammer paper, it provides a proof of concept program that can be run directly on your PC. It's an, just a C++ program. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it's just a piece of C code. So you just like uh, access uh, a cache line, flush it, access another cache line, flush it. You do this many, many times and there are bit flips. Yeah. Okay. So the implemented uh, mitigations are para, uh, an idealized version of twice that doesn't uh, care about the, uh, the, the row tracking uh, table size. Graphene, para, hydra, randomized row swap, and then ideal mitigation uh, that uh, tracks the activation count for every DRAM row with an infinite capability, and we call this the ideal. We configure all of these mechanisms for a varying row hammer threshold, that is the minimum number of DRAM row activations to cause at least one bit, one bit flip or TRH, from 5,000 down to extreme values of only 10. And we evaluate uh, the performance overhead caused by these Rohammer mitigation techniques measured by weighted speed up with 25 four core multi-programmed benign workloads that we form uh, from benchmark suites uh, like spec 06 and, spy, uh, and spec 17. And we feed these tra uh, traces into a, um, uh, simplistic out of order core model that we use as the simulation front end in this study. So here are the key, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the key results. We have the normalized uh, weighted speed, uh, speed up on the Y axis and the Rohammer threshold on the uh, X axis. And here you, you can clearly see how different Rohammer mitigation techniques scales as we uh, reduce the Rohammer uh, threshold. So for, uh, for example, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the ideal case performs really well because we have infinite tracking capability that yet yeah, there's almost no uh, false positives of aggressor rows. And for randomized row swap, it scales the worst. And after let's say TRCD smaller than, than 50, the simulation time is too long that we have to kill it. And the reason for this is for very low row hammer uh, thresholds, the row swapping operations will cause more row swapping operations and kind of and they kind of cascades and just like prevents the DRAM from serving normal access requests. So now uh, let me conclude my uh, presentation. So uh, we introduced Ramlinter 2.0, which is a modern modular and extensible DRAM simulator and the successor to Ramlinter 1.0. We introduce and demonstrate the key design features that enables its high modularity and extensibility. 
We hope Run Manager 2.0's modular and extensible software architecture and concise and intuitive way of modeling DRAM can facilitate more uh, agile memory systems re uh, re research. If you're interested in more details, uh, you can take a look at our paper and also the uh, open source version of Run Manager 2. And finally, I have, sorry, I have an advertisement. So we have a bunch of semester projects available uh, with Run Manager with RAM related 2.0. Um, since we have the modular infrastructure, you can easily implement many different things. For example, you can implement and verify new DRAM standards, new emerging memory technologies, uh, implement a test framework so that we can be more confident about the correctness of the key components that we model in RAM related 2.0. This is now feasible with the modular infrastructure that you can easily set up a mock environment to test individual components. And in Ram to 1.0, like a lot of things are coupled. So it's very hard to isolate a component from the rest of the system to be tested. You can implement an, a valid hybrid memory, uh, hybrid memory systems. This also becomes easier because you just have multiple interfaces to memory controllers that has different implementations of different DRAM interface. Of course, you can propose your own ideas and we welcome uh, new and exciting designs. And if you're interested, just dropping drop me an email and we can uh, meet and discuss your uh, plans. So yeah, that's all from my side. If you have uh, any question, I'm happy to answer. Okay, cool. So yeah, thank you uh, very much. And Mm -hmm. So I'll, uh, so this is the last part of the of today's lecture, and uh, I'll be talking about uh, one of the uh, a state of the art SSD simulator uh, in QSIM. Uh, so I'm I'm Rakesh. Uh, I'm a PhD student. Uh, in, in the Safari Research Group since uh, 2021. And uh, previously I was working at uh, Samsung uh, Semiconductor uh, uh, Research Division. And I have my master's degree from uh, University of California at Irvine. So some of my research interests include uh, memory and storage systems, NAND flash memory in particular, uh, performing near data processing and uh, machine learning. And uh, please feel free to to contact me uh, using this email or on LinkedIn or uh, Twitter. So I'll quickly jump to this uh, uh, to discuss uh, MQSIM. So MQSIM is a framework for enabling realistic uh, studies of uh, modern multi-queue SSD devices. And this paper was, uh, this work was published in uh, FAST 2018. So I'll I'll briefly go over the executive summary to give a give an idea of what we are looking at. So uh, solid state drives are uh, continuously evolving to keep pace with the demands of performance and uh, capacity uh, in data centers and in consumer uh, devices, consumer uh, computing environments. And uh, multi queue SSDs are uh, what we call NVMe SSDs, 
they are the uh, the standard devices right now and uh, we also have a, uh, have ssds which are using uh, emerging storage technologies like uh, pcm and 3d xpoint and uh, existing sim simulators have not kept kept up with these changes because uh, they don't uh, support major features such as multi queue protocols like nvme um, efficient steady state uh, ssd models and uh, full end to end uh, request latency uh, so when we uh, in this paper we perform a characterization and uh, we identify that the best existing simulator has around 68 to 85 percent error rate uh, when we compare its performance with real mq uh, or multi queue ssds so uh, mqsim is uh, a new open source simulator that models all the major features of conventional ssds and uh, modern multi queue ssds and it's also um, uh, it's available with full uh, or it basically can be integrated with a uh, full system uh, in with simulators like gem5 and it also performs accurate uh, request uh, latency modeling and application uh, it can interact with the application uh, in a tightly integrated manner and it also enables uh, several research directions uh, we will discuss a couple of them uh, in this uh, presentation so uh, and also mqsim is very is highly accurate and it's validated against uh, four real multi queue ssds and the error rate is somewhere ranging between 6 to 18% so so this is the GitHub link for the for the simulator uh, code. And uh, if you are interested, please feel free to uh, look at this and uh, play around with the uh, simulator. So now uh, let's look at, uh, I'll just give a brief idea of what is uh, what are the components in a modern SSD. If you have attended uh, the previous lecture where Mohammed discussed all this, uh, you would have a fair idea of uh, the components in the, inside a modern SSD. So uh, a modern SSD has two uh, parts to it. One is the backend, which is basically where the data storage uh, is, is uh, or data is stored. And this is done using uh, memory chips, which could be NAND flash memory or uh, PCM or 3D X point. And you can see there are, uh, how do I enable this? Oh yeah, you can see multiple channels flash channels here, which connect uh, a number of flash chips. And uh, so these flash channels are shared uh, across different flash chips. So then we have a front end, which is uh, called the host interface uh, layer. And here, uh, this is typically uh, the layer which uh, implements the PCIe protocol to interact with the host. And it also, uh, what it does is it takes the request from the, from the application or from the host and uh, it divides that into smaller requests, which the FTL can process. And now we move to the FTL part, which is basically the, the brain of the SSD, which manages uh, the different resources, the processes, and uh, also uh, handles the IO requests. So here um, we can see that there is a cache management part, which, hand, which manages the right cache. There is also the address translation, which looks at, uh, which translates the logical address to physical address uh, inside the flash chip, inside the uh, flash backend. And there is also transaction scheduling, which, uh, which looks at um, um, sending the commands to the flash chip and, uh, and also uh, looks at the interference that is happening in the backend. And there are also, uh, there is also a cached mapping table, which is uh, basically where the part of the address translation uh, uh, table is stored in, in the DRAM. And also we have a number of uh, uh, queues which are uh, which are specific to each chip, and uh, and that can handle the writes and reads and the garbage collection that uh, we show here. So there uh, so there are a bunch of flash controllers which uh, in which uh, basically is uh, responsible for doing the transaction scheduling, and that those FCC uh, components uh, send the commands and the uh, uh, commands to the backend. So, so flash. Uh, so, how do we manage these SSD resources? So, flash writes can take place only to pages that are erased, as you may already know about this. Uh, so, uh, in SSDs, what we do is we write out of place. We perform out of place updates 
that is we write to a different page every time uh, uh, there is an update to a particular uh, page and uh, we mark the old one as invalid so uh, for every request or for an, every update to a page there should be a update to the logical to physical uh, mapping and which uh, which actually uh, makes uh, the cache mapping table more important because uh, it we, we always don't want to write to the back end uh, where the part of the mapping table is all the, where the full mapping table is stored and after a point we also need to uh, look at garbage collection because uh, as we uh, as more and more uh, invalid pages grow in the ssd we also need to reclaim those pages and uh, make them usable again for uh, new writes so so write cache as i mentioned decreases the resource con contention and reduces the latency so uh, so this is about uh, giving a quick snapshot of what uh, what are the components in the modern ssd now uh, i'll discuss the challenges of modeling the modern multi queue ssds which is typically the nvme ssds so uh, state of the art simulators that are designed for conventional ssds uh, are only designed for conventional SSDs, which basically means that they inherit a lot of features from the hard drive, hard disk drives, which use SATA protocol, and uh, those uh, those simulators model uh, SATA protocol only. And uh, so, if we compare the performance of several simulators to uh, four modern uh, MQ sim MQ SSDs, we see that uh, those uh, the error rate of uh, the best performing simulator is is around 85 percent 70 to 85 percent which is still a very high number when we are trying to accurately model the ssd so why is this error rate so high uh, we think that this is because most features uh, the features of modern multi queue ssds are missing in these existing simulators which means that nvme protocol is not supported by many of them and they also, as Mohammed mentioned, so they need to also support uh, steady state behavior, which means that most of these SSDs uh, model the, or they provide a model which is like the fresh out of the box SSDs. And also uh, they don't really uh, do a full modeling of the end-to-end -end request latency. So let's look at, uh, uh, each each of these challenges. So uh, let's look at the support for multi queue protocols. So um, so typically uh, these simulators uh, implement the SATA protocol, which is uh, which is uh, a protocol that was used traditionally for hard disk drives. And uh, here the the main thing is that even though there are uh, software queues for each process, there is a uh, in the operating system there is an I/O scheduler and it can only use a single queue for uh, dispatching to the uh, to the SSD. So there is a bottleneck in this case. So this hardware dispatch queue can be a bottleneck and also this IO scheduler because it needs to decide uh, which one to send it first. Does it multiplex here? Yes, kind of. Kind of multiplexes, okay. It depends on the scheduling policy. So what is the limitation for that? Why it is having only one single what is the limitation? So again, it, it I mean, it all uh, comes from the hard disk drive uh, uh, era where you basically had a rotating disk. And even if you had, even if you try to parallelize, you can only, I mean, you the rotating disk had to kind of move to the particular sector, get the data and then move somewhere else. So it's, it's basically a limitation from the uh, previous architectures. Thank you. So then, uh, so once we have the hardware dispatch queue uh, ready, then the SSD device would uh, consume the request from that. Now, so when uh, modern uh, protocols like NVMe were implemented, uh, which actually provides a lot of parallelism and improvement in throughput, what it did was to bypass this OS scheduling and the hardware dispatch queue and provided direct interface between the uh, the request queues uh, from the process uh, from the from each process uh, to the device. So there are queues implemented in the software layer, also in the hardware layer. So 
So none of the existing simulators, at least at the time when this uh, work was introduced, did uh, model the new protocols. And uh, in this paper, we also show that uh, how multi-queues uh, affect the multi-queues in real MQSSDs affect performance and fairness. So the second aspect is, uh, as I mentioned, is to model the steady state uh, behavior uh, accurately without which you will uh, have the high error percentage that you uh, that we meant, that we showed before so as i said most of these uh, simulators try to model the ssds as fresh out of the box ssds which means that there is no um, um, let's say the effect uh, effect of uh, garbage collection or other policies which are uh, running inside the ssd and also the write cache uh, is not warmed up in a fresh out of the box SSD, which means that you you tend to always go to the uh, back end to access the mapping uh, information. So, so many uh, previous uh, SSD studies incorrectly simulate the fresh out of the box behavior, and it's also very difficult to reach uh, steady state in most uh, simulators. And uh, one of the simulator is called SSD Sim, which is actually uh, in, which was implemented based on disk sim. Uh, that Mohammed mentioned, and uh, this for in this simulator, if you want to reach the steady state, it it takes up uh, around 80 times the execution time. Uh, and the other aspect is that if we also look at some of these workloads that that are uh, shown here, the the total write volume of these workloads is is very very minimal, and uh, let's say the average is around 60 GB, uh, 60 gigabyte. And uh, this is this is very small compared to the actual size of the uh, SSD itself. So it's very hard to use these kind of workloads to um, to warm the uh, or reach the steady state behavior. So we need to have other uh, uh, ways of doing it. And uh, so existing more simulators either don't model the steady state uh, accurately or they are very slow to reach that particular state. The next aspect is to model the request latency accurately. So here we show uh, a request to the NAND flash based SSD. And uh, this is uh, for a, a flash page of, let's say, four kilobytes. And here we show, this is just to show the different uh, uh, steps in which the uh, command or the, uh, we go from the uh, user application to the flash chip and uh, back to the user application. So here we see that uh, the command that is sent from the user application to the host memory takes around well, less than one microsecond. And from the host memory, which is the DRAM to the, the host interface layer inside the device, even that takes uh, less time. So then it goes to the firmware and then back then to the NAND flash chip. And the most time consuming part of this uh, exercise is basically the flash read and the data transfer from the uh, the flash chip to the, uh, let's say, the firmware. So this is, uh, as, as we show here, it's, those are the highest contributing uh, latencies. So typically in, a, in the modern TLC NAND flash chip, you have 50 to 100 microseconds of uh, read latency, and you have 20 microseconds of uh, data transfer latency. So, so current simulators only model, uh, let's say, steps five and six, uh, which means that they only look at the read latency and the data transfer latency. And also, uh, this, this uh, model of the latency may change when, when the underlying uh, the technology of the, um, the storage technology, technology changes. So, so here we see uh, the similar case where uh, we use a 3D point based SSD and uh, here, I just want to mention that the latency is just is less than five microseconds. The read latency is less than five microseconds. So the highest contribution is basically in terms of request processing and uh, the, the response uh, data transfer over the PCIe. So these two aspects is basic, uh, they contribute more and the simulators have to adapt to these kind of technologies as well. So. So existing model simulators don't model all the parts of a request latency, and uh, it also causes inaccuracies for new NVMs. So in summary, uh, these are the three challenges that we already discussed, and uh, these features, these missing uh, features, lead to high inaccuracy. 
So the goal was to develop a new simulator that faithfully models all these uh, features and uh, also support modern uh, NVMe and uh, SATA based, based SSDs. So I'll, I'll briefly go over the design of MQSIM and uh, then look at uh, some results from the evaluation. So some of the major features of uh, MQSIM is it accurately models conventional SATA based SSDs and uh, modern uh, NVMe based SSDs, which means that it supports multiple queues and uh, steady state behavior and uh, a full model of end-to-end uh, -end request latency. So you can see here that there is a post interface implemented in the front end, the FTL is implemented, and also the transaction scheduling unit, which uh, basically sends the commands to the backend. And the backend is also quite modular in a way that you can change the technology and it, it works uh, seamlessly. So, so it basically uh, models all the things that we discussed uh, in the initial part of this uh, presentation. So, and it also, as I said, it, it is a flexible design and it supports uh, modular components and it also can um, support emerging uh, NVM technologies. And this is a uh, open source uh, uh, simulator and uh, it's written in C++, so you could uh, uh, take a look at this. And as one thing to mention is this, uh, as Mohammed mentioned, this is an event-driven simulator. So uh, it doesn't really depend on the system uh, clock or the, the number of cycles. So basically what it means is that every event that that uh, is being sent to the simulator is added, uh, every operation is being treated as an event and uh, the simulator will move from one event to another. And uh, these events are being stored in a, in a red and black tree which is uh, which is the uh, which is also uh, easily manageable in the in the simulator. So th this is basically uh, a snapshot of what uh, MQSIM is uh, uh, MQSIM looks like. So I'll I'll briefly talk about the experimental methodology. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, please let me know. So uh, so in MQ so what we do is we compare MQSIM with four. Um, real modern data center SSDs. And here you have a couple of uh, uh, MLC SSDs, which is multi-level cell, and then a, T a couple of TLC uh, SSDs. And uh, this, this is basically the system configuration. Uh, we use an Intel Xeon system, and all of these SSDs support uh, NVMe protocol. And we also uh, precondition them to by writing to 70% of the available logical space. and uh, Basically, uh, these parameters can be modeled in uh, MQSIM. Uh, so, so what we do is we test using multiple I/O flows, as uh, Mohammed mentioned. So here we basically look at uh, handling uh, concurrent uh, workloads, and uh, here one flow is basically one application. And uh, so we we also look at queue depth, which controls the flow greediness or the number of simultaneous requests. So the more uh, the queue depth the basically the more intense the re read or write operations will be. And here we show a few representative uh, results. Uh, so basically we now look at how, uh, compare how the interflow inter uh, or interflow interference looks like in a modern, in a real SSD and how MQSIM can model it. So here we look at a real SSD and uh, basically we, we have two flows. So here, what we show is basically a, uh, the slowdown and the throughput for, uh, let's say, SSD C. Um, and then we also show the fairness. So for flow one, which is basically one, let's say, a, a workload running with, uh, for which we have fixed the queue depth to be eight. And uh, we in this experiment, we basically sweep over a number of queue depth uh, values for the flow two. So what we see here is that uh, when the as we increase the queue depth, the uh, the throughput increase throughput decreases because of the interference, and also the slowdown increases. How do we measure the slowdown? It is basically the response time when both these flows are running versus uh, uh, the ratio of the response time when both the flows are are running to the response time when only one flow is running. <coughs> Sorry, so. Uh, so this is basically showing us that there is an, an interference 
uh, is responsible for the slowdown and also the, uh, the throughput uh, reducing. In case of uh, flow two, what, what happens is because the, Q, the flow one is having a fixed Q depth, you can see that uh, the slowdown is much less. Uh, it actually reduces and the throughput increases. And when we increase the Q depth values to a very high value, there is also a loss of fairness, which means that if there are multiple requests that are uh, coming to the system, then uh, this SSD cannot handle the handle it fairly. In, um, so we see the fairness uh, reducing. So MQSIM is able to actually uh, accurately model this SSD, and uh, we see that. Uh, this uh, uh, the trend is actually captured in the results on MQSIM as well. So you can see that even slowdown is captured and uh, the increase in um, uh, reduction in throughput is captured. So, so this is one result that we see uh, where basically we have a lot of interference uh, because of running multiple workloads. Now, uh, so MQSIM accurately captures the, this interference. Now we have another SSD where there is some uh, level of fairness control inside the SSD itself. Uh, this is a real SSD. So here you can see that uh, the slowdown actually uh, is, is saturates uh, even when you increase the Q depth. So this is uh, basically uh, after a point it saturates and the throughput also remains the same. So, which means that the SSD is able is having some policy to accurately or basically to um, maintain the fairness for different uh, applications. So, uh, this also can be modeled accurately using MQSIM. Um, so, this is another observation that we have from our evaluation. So, uh, MQSIM models the impact of control mechanisms also, uh, which which are uh, there to mitigate the interflow interference. So then we look at uh, capturing the steady state behavior with MQSIM. So um, MQSIM includes a efficient uh, SSD preconditioning mechanism, which is um, which is very fast. And uh, unlike SSD SIM that we saw, it doesn't take as much time in terms of execution. And uh, so this can uh, this can be uh, disabled to let's say treat the device as a fresh out of the box device as also. So what it does is it uh, it has a two pass approach, uh, but the the key part of this is to basically scan the entire storage space, and only set the metadata for each physical page to be an invalid page. So that that basically makes it uh, uh, a steady state uh, behavior. So here you can see that uh, we we show the read and write uh, times on the y axis and the simulation time. So the the color pink actually represents the the actual ssd and uh, the no precondition is shown in black and uh, with precondition is in blue so the pink and the blue should actually be uh, in the similar uh, group but uh, without precondition you can see that the latency is quite less which is not what we want when we want to accurately model the device so after a point when, uh, let's say we have done sufficient writes, it actually increases and uh, goes to the uh, level of preconditioning. So this is another uh, thing, another feature of MQSIM where we can perform the preconditioning. So uh, so the response time difference is, uh, is quite less when uh, between the actual SSD and MQSIM with preconditioning. <coughs> so now let's look at, um, Evaluating the accuracy of MQSIM. So, um, so we evaluate using uh, two synthetic flows, which means that these workloads are generated by the simulator itself. So you, uh, along with running, let's say, external workloads that you can also run in MQSIM, you can also generate your own workload uh, by giving the uh, workload distribution and many such characteristics. If you uh, take a look at the, the repo, then you can... Um, um, basically look at um, generating your own workflow workflows so here we see that uh, in one of the uh, flows where there are only read requests we see the for different ssds we see that uh, what we see here in white is basically the values for real ssd and we show the the read uh, response times 
and uh, MQSM is shown in black. So basically, the if you look at all these bars, it's kind of similar in terms of value with a few differences. Uh, so, so here we show the error uh, percentage or uh, or the number of errors, and for each uh, scenario where uh, we have different request sizes, the error remains quite low. So that that is uh, so basically with uh, reads, it it's able to match the real device performance also. And with writes, you can see that uh, it, it shows a similar behavior. In some cases, you have some uh, differences. Uh, but again, um, so when we compare the error rate versus real SSDs, we see that the error, uh, error rate for the read latency is around 2.9% and write latency is around 4.9% when we average it across all the four SSDs. So, um, so MQSM is basically um, more accurate than uh, existing simulators in a way that um, let so we when we measure the overall uh, error rate versus real MQSSDs, we see that MQSM ranges anywhere between eight to fourteen percent. So this is uh, or six to fourteen percent. Sorry. So this is uh, when we compare the total workload execution time and match it with the real device execution time for the same workload. When did you do this? This, this was done in 2018. So open SSD is also there, right? No, I think. No, open channel SSD. You mean open channel SSDs? Yeah, that came. Uh, I don't know what uh, if open SSD is a simulator or uh, open channel SSD is basically trying to uh, where we have put the FTL functionality or part of the SSD functionality in the host system. So that is a different. Uh, uh, it's not a uh, yeah, I've seen it in Rec SSD paper. Okay. So that's that's not a simulator, and uh, there you, you basically implement parts of the uh, SSD functionality in the host. So, uh, okay, uh, Cosmos and, uh, yeah, op so that if that is an FPGA-based infrastructure. Okay, so uh, so MQSM is an order of magnitude more accurate than uh, accurate at modeling uh, multi-queue SSDs than state-of-the-art SSD simulators. So uh, now uh, we'll quickly look at uh, research directions enabled by MQSM. So we have a few more minutes. So uh, here we look at, uh, again, we basically uh, review what MQSM does it accurately models uh, these multi-queue SSDs, and this this can enable new research directions and studies, which is not possible with existing simulators. It also um, it can accurately model the fairness and performance effects of interflow interference with uh, within an SSD. And here we see that uh, there can be three sources of contention, which is one is the write cache. The other one could be, is the ma cached mapping table and uh, then the backend uh, memory resources. So here we quickly look at some results uh, to see what uh, how MQSIM can capture this. So uh, let's look at uh, the interference at write cache. And here we have two flows which concurrently uh, perform random writes. So flow one has, a, has high cache locality and flow two has uh, poor cache locality. And the flow to um, is basically uh, the queue depth is increased so that to make to make the uh, the writes more intensive so when we look at uh, the flow one again the flow one queue depth is fixed in this in all these experiments and flow two is uh, the queue depth of flow two is swept across different values so if we look at the slowdown uh, then we see that for uh, for smaller queue depths, then uh, we have a less, we have uh, actually uh, very less load on, but then once the uh, queue depth increases, then we see the interference at the at the right cache. And this is mainly because of uh, cache thrashing and uh, which destroys the flow once cache locality. And, uh, and flow two doesn't have as much effect, uh, flow one doesn't have as much effect on flow two because that has a fixed Q depth and uh, the right intensity is, remains more or less the same. So then we look at um, interference at cached mapping table. 
and uh, here we look at two flows which concurrently read with different access patterns flow one is more mostly sequential which means that uh, it is a, it sends large requests which are uh, which are sequential requests and then flow two is split between uh, sequential and random and again uh, basically we increase the randomness of flow two to uh, to affect more misses at the cache mapping table so here we see that uh, when we increase the randomness of flow two, flow one slowdown actually increases. So which means that it is uh, basically impacting by uh, storing more data in the cached mapping table. Flow two actually affects, uh, pollutes the cached mapping table, uh, and uh, flow one's values have to be read from the backend. Flow two remains the same because flow one doesn't actually cause any kind of uh, interference to, with it. So more random flow to increases the CMT thrashing, and uh, this significantly affects the slowdown of the flow one. Now, last uh, the last characterization that we do is to look at the backend and how interference is affecting the backend. So we have two flows which concurrently perform random access reads, and flow one has low intensity, and flow two has high high intensity. And uh, we increase the flow to greediness, which is increasing the Q depth and the write intensity. So here we see that uh, by when we increase the Q depth of flow to, uh, as we see here, the the slowdown uh, occurs for flow one uh, in a more rapid way. Uh, so this means that when flow two is more intense, the chip level queues which are which I showed in the uh, in the DRAM, which are stored in the DRAM their queue depth actually increases, which means more and more uh, uh, commands get queued up in these chip level queues. And this causes more uh, requests from flow one to wait for much longer. So this is, uh, this is another behavior that uh, we can accurately capture in uh, MQSIM. So, <clears throat> so in the paper, we, there are also some studies to show the application level uh, uh, performance metrics like IPC slowdown and fairness. So uh, I would refer you to the paper for that. So in conclusion, uh, again, uh, some of the existing simulators don't model the the latest uh, SSD uh, protocols such as multi queue protocols. They don't uh, efficiently uh, uh, model the steady state behavior and capture the end to end request latencies. And uh, MQCM does all of that, and it can also support uh, new research directions. And basically, the, the error rate is also quite less. I think this should be six, uh, six to eighteen percent. I need to fix this. But yeah, this is a uh, this is an open source code, and uh, and in in the past semesters, we have also had students who have worked on this and uh, uh, made improvements on this uh, simulator. So. If you are uh, if you are interested in uh, working on SSDs and uh, knowing about knowing more about SSDs, please uh, take a look at the simulator and uh, feel free to contact uh, Mohammed or uh, me, and we can uh, have some projects that uh, that you can work on. So that marks the end of uh, my presentation. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you.